Uh, micro-credentialing uh, strategies, tips from the front lines. Um, we have uh, two chat options today, a couple quick housekeeping tips. Um, there is a chat function on the right-hand uh, screen uh, and one in the blue bar below the video. Um, so to best organize questions for speakers, we'd love for you to use the chat feature in the blue bar uh, for that purpose. And we'll continue to monitor both chats um, and share those questions back with the speakers wherever you put them. Um, so please, please do participate in the session by sharing your thoughts, uh, posting links um, to resources and asking questions. Um, and if you are going to ask a question, uh, please put just a question mark at the beginning of that, um, just to ensure uh, that, that we get to that and we uh, can uh, slide through those, those various questions and chat functions. Um, uh, one functional note about the platform, um, you can click in uh, to the view uh, section of your uh, feed loop screen. If you hover toward the middle uh, and select an option to uh, collapse the side menus or make it full screen. And that may help just ensure a better viewing experience for you. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it off to your uh, moderator today, uh, Luke Dowden, uh, to get you started. Good afternoon. Thanks for hanging in with us towards the end of the day. Uh, micro and alternate credentials are a fast growing segment of the emerging digital post-secondary landscape. Community colleges are on the front lines of micro-credentialing, pursuing strategies to stack all forms of alternate credentials into certificate degree programs. I'm, I'm joined by leaders of four very large community colleges, and me being one, representing four states. We're going to share with you how we're exploring designing and are creating alternate pathways into the college into college uh, for workers. Um, so uh, that's that's what we're here to do today. I'm Luke Dowden. I'm the Chief Online Learning Officer for the Alamo Colleges District in San Antonio, Texas. I serve five uh, Hispanic serving institutions uh, all across uh, Bear County and beyond in South Texas. And so I'm going to just go over a few housekeeping notes and invite our panelists to, um, to introduce themselves. Uh, Rachel, do you mind to go back one slide, please? So uh, just invite you, I know it's the end of the day, you've probably got a lot on your mind to be fully present with us. Uh, we've got some just great content and questions with some expert uh, panelists. Um, use the chat tool, if you will, please stay on mute. Uh, use the chat tool either in Zoom or in the uh, conference tool. Uh, we've got folks monitoring that uh, to make sure that we either answer your questions in real time or at the end of the uh, the presentation. Um, we want to make sure that we can get all of our content uh, to you uh, and, and again, plenty of time for your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to invite our panelists to introduce themselves. Erica? Hi, my name is Erica Barrero and I currently serve as the Future of Work Strategist at Central New Mexico Community College and I was formerly the Dean for the School of Communication, Humanities, and Social Sciences. And Rose? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rose Rojas and I work with the Maricopa Community Colleges um, and I am the District Director for Curriculum and Transfer. Uh, Maricopa is located in Arizona and we have 10 colleges independently accredited underneath our district office. And Leslie. Hi everyone, my name is Leslie Voigt and I'm the Director of the Digital Credentials Institute at Madison College in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we've been issuing and working in digital badges in this space since actually 2010 and issued our first badge in 2012. So we've been doing this for a long time. So we've got a poll for you. Rachel's going to put up a poll and um, Erica's going to read that for you while you uh, take time to answer it. We want to uh, want to get a sense of the audience. Uh, we can't be with you in person, but we kind of want to know where you are and, and your institution's strategy around micro-credentialing. So for those of you that might be on devices where you can't access the poll, we wanted you to at least know what the question is. So the question is, where is your institution and its strategy for offering micro-credentials? We're still trying to figure out what the heck micro-credentials are and or whether or not we want to offer them. Second, uh, we've identified a few micro-credentials and we're going to start offering these in the new future. Third, we are currently offering some micro-credentials Fourth, we are working on a strategy to embed micro-credential options in many of our programs. And finally, 
we should be facilitating this session as we have executed a robust suite of micro-credential options across many of our degree and non-degree programs. And good news to my fellow panelists, so far we do not have anyone that feels they should be facilitating this session rather than ourselves. So we're going to give it just a one more minute, if you don't mind. We want to get as many responses in. We've got about half of our participants that are responding. We want to see kind of where the group is. If you don't mind to participate in that poll, it kind of helps us. Give more seconds. There's got to be someone out there that is executing micro credentials robustly. Yeah, we were looking to add a surprise panelist. That was kind of in our uh, <laughs> <laughs> surprise for us and you. All right, so it looks like most of our audience, uh, right? So over uh, over 70% are trying to figure out what the heck micro-credentials are. And they've identified a few and are going to start offering them in the near future, a much smaller group. So have you uh, shared the results, Rachel? I just did it. I beat Rachel. All right, thank you. Um, so I, I can't say, uh, Erica or panelists, that I'm surprised or not surprised, right? You never know the, the interest of the audience or, or where they are. So well, we're glad you're here to learn, Norma, and, and are with us today. We're going to shift to our first question, um, which is, what is a micro-credential? I mean, what, are, what are we even talking about today? So we'll just, I'll review that in our first slide. Um, I needed to address this own question uh, within my community college district, right? And so a micro-credential is a non-college credit. It's training. It's focused on a single skill or a set of skills. Um, and it typically leads to some type of award that's digitally discoverable, like a digital badge uh, that signals some completion, some mastery, some knowledge of that skill or that set of skills. And for us, much like you heard Leslie reference, digital badges are just one type of micro-credential, right? And within the district that I work in, we have two types of learning experiences in which we've embedded um, those, those digital badges. But that's only one of the things that we're doing. But hopefully, we, we use the National Education Association um, definition of a micro-credential. So I don't want you to think it's something that we created. We, we borrowed it, and I thought I had put the reference there, and I apologize to any of you that didn't. We'll fix that in the final slides. Um, so that's that's how we're defining a micro-credential for the purposes of our presentation today. Rachel, will you go to our, uh, our next slide? And I think Leslie's going to give you even more of a framework. So what we're looking at is what's kind of included in your micro-credential suite. At Madison College, we have many different lines of what we call uh, our differing micro-credentials. What you're seeing here on the screen is one of those lines. It's our skill development badges. So when you have any kind of credential, whether it's a micro-credential, whether it's a degree, whether it's a PhD, there's a value that's associated with that credential. So what this taxonomy of our skill development credentials is doing for us is creating that value. What, what is that currency? What is that value when somebody earns that degree or that credential? And also when somebody consumes that credential, they know what they're looking at and they know the value of that. So we have things from skill development, as you're looking here, we have awards credentials, uh, very simple in the way you present a paper certificate, now it's digitally done. Uh, we have internal training, we have articulation or credit for prior learning type micro-credentials, and all of these have these very defined value statements or taxonomies around them that help really define what that suite of credentials is that lives sometimes outside and sometimes within our bigger degree programs or certificate programs. So Leslie, I have to ask, and I, I secretly know the answer because I've seen you present a few times and uh, it, it was one of my uh, one of my goals for us to be able to present together. Did you have this all figured out ahead of time or did it grow organically? Can you talk about yeah. that? Absolutely did not have this figured out ahead of time. Uh, we have, as I said in the beginning, we've been we've been in the micro-credential space since 2010, and we have actually been issuing credentials since 2012. 
So these grew very organically over time. In fact, that last kind of black and white image that you saw there was one that actually just came out this summer, summer 2021, because we had one line for certificates and we realized there was a very big value difference between an externally recognized certificate and our internal defined certificates. So as you start to get into the space, those of you who are already in this space may already be, be hitting against some of this. You create the value of what is your, your credential. And then you start to come up with all kinds of different ideas about, wait, we could do this, and maybe we could do this. And it doesn't quite, it's kind of like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. So you have to come up with these different types of values. Make sure they all make sense for you and make sure you have them defined so that they add value to what you're already offering. But once you start in this space, you are going to find ways that they're just gonna naturally grow organically over time. Yeah, and I would say as well, and we've purposely grown organically. I saw a lot of models early on and, and certainly don't have the years of experience in badging that you do. We've been at it for about four years. I saw people lock themselves into a framework that it looked like there was not a lot of room for mid-course correction. And we didn't want to do that. So we purposely have given ourselves some guiding principles and some parameters, but the flexibility to go and grow. And, and Rose, I wonder like uh, at Maricopa, like what's your experience been like when you're talking about micro-credentials? Where is your community at in this discussion? So we are offering micro-credentials, um, but how we got there was we pretty much backed into it. So uh, in higher education, we have a tendency, and I could speak for Maricopa, is we like to kind of talk topics to death, right? We, we're trying to search for the perfect exact definition of what a micro-cert or micro-credential was. Um, there's not one nationally agreed upon definition. You could probably draw and many um, from different organizations and associations. So how we were able to get to what we call a micro-credential was we wanted to um, identify the attributes. What is it and what is it's not? And so we knew that we had certificates that could probably be identified as a micro-credential. So we identify what we call these attributes. They have to be transparent. It has to bring value. It has to be relevant. It has to be stackable and transparent. And so once we began identifying what we wanted, then we did have um, several certificates of completion that met that definition. And so that we were able to quickly then market and promote these as micro-credentials. Um, so now that we have that definition and those attributes, then we've actually incorporated, incorporated that in our curriculum design. So as they're developing curriculum, if they meet those attributes, if it's you know less than 26 weeks and can be completed under 16 credits and it meets the rest of those attributes, then we can market it effectively and successfully as a micro-credential. What about terminology? Did you did y'all experience some anxiety over terms? Do you, do you want to reflect on that at all? Yeah, we did. And, and um, just, again, like several terms in higher education, especially now with um, all this innovation that's going on, I think people um, begin to use it interchangeably. And so I think that that adds to confusion. And so going back to what Leslie said, is as you know, you have your work team and you're discussing micro-credential, what makes sense for your organization? And then what also makes sense for students, the learners, the receiving, and as well as business and industry? So I think in combination, you really have to kind of work on your geography, your um, university partners, kind of all those stakeholders to come to a definition and what makes sense for your institution. Yeah, we had an employer event this summer, and I had two, we have a lot of different chambers of commerce here, so I had, I had two representatives from two of the chambers of commerce, and they just said to me, Luke, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it micro-credentials, you can call it badging, but it's up to you to tell us what it is and what it means, and then we'll help you to figure out how you communicate its relevance to the business community. But when it came to terms, I mean, they were just very direct, like, we, we're, we don't care about the terms, you need to tell us what it, what it means, and we'll help you make the connection. And um, I, I appreciated that, right? I, I appreciated that directness about terms. Erica, any reflection on what you've heard so far with the what's in the suite and the terminology? Because I know you're our future of work strategist. So I'm curious what you're thinking. 
Um, well, I, I think I'll, I'll hold my comments for a future question, but I did want to point out Karen had a question um, and she was asking, what do we mean by transparency in the list of attributes for micro-credentials? So what we mean that is um, really being transparent with the student in, in terms of what can they get from a micro-credential as opposed to a regular certificate or a degree. Um, additionally, we want to be transparent to our industry partners um, working with them in, in developing and designing, um, as well as transcripting it. Now, we have not gone to, to the transcription or the identification of whether or not it's going to be um, transcripted as a micro-credential on a student's transcript or how that's going to, um, you know, what the outcome of those conversations. So, again, we're still kind of in mid-process of identifying, you know, what the attributes are and then being able to promote and offer it and then talking about how to implement. So um, I think it's just really trying to be transparent in the value of what it brings in earning a micro-credential. And then uh, Leslie, I don't know if you or Luke know, uh, Siddhikanta asked if there's a, an international organization or a professional uh, society that is ahead in the game and is standardizing uh, the digital uh, credential taxonomy. So do you wanna take that or? Uh, go ahead. Okay, so IMS Global is the, and I'm going to air quote this, owner of digital badges, the technology, not the taxonomy. So they are the people who are uh, the group that is working with all the different badge vendors or micro-credential, the software vendors that, that make these digital, that creates the standards which with they all have to play by. So there's a, there's a standard in order to be recognized as a vendor of this software, you have to meet the standards that they are putting forward. As far as the taxonomy, we in the US do not have any standardization in that space uh, for good and for bad. So what that means is you all can create your own if you wish, uh, you can borrow, bag, steal, you know, whatever, however you want to make that work and, and create something that works for you. So you can create your own organically grown types of credentials, which is fantastic. I do know that in other countries, we have um, clients in, in many different countries, there is a lot more standardization of education in general. So there's a, there's a more of a top-down approach. And they do have very clear definitions of what this type of credential is, what this type of credential is. I don't see that necessarily happening in the U.S., at least not for a long time, because the, the whole premise of, of this space when it started back in 2005 was anybody can earn a badge, anybody can create a badge. It has backed off from that somewhat, but we are now, you know, 15 plus years down the road to where people are looking for what is the value. So those of you just getting started, those of you building, you'd still need to define the value. And do I wish there was some standardization across this? Most definitely. But I also love the fact that because there isn't, we can kind of create our own and what works for each of us. One of the things I'll uh, take an opportunity to add to that, I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to join the uh, National Governors Association convening last week around uh, skills-based uh, learning, but there are a lot of players right now that are looking at, um, rather than standardizing what we're all using, that we have common language that we can anchor all of our credentials, including degrees, associate degrees in that. So if, if you aren't following, if you're interested in this work and you aren't following like Open Skills Network, um, that's an organization that is really um, developing what's called rich skill descriptors that um, pretty soon, you know, their goal is that all of us will be able to go into this registered database of rich skill district descriptors and do a search based on the topic, the type of credential that we're using, and be able to at least use common language that is the metadata behind the credentials that we are issuing. I, whole, I wholeheartedly agree, Erica, because I know that in our, again, going back to our attributes, they have to be portable and stackable. So we try to work um, and we'll be working with closely with our university partners, as well as our industry um, partners to um, help inform and understand what that common terminology is so that 
as students are, you know, dipping in and out of higher education, they're able to take, you know, those credentials with them and have that be easily identifiable as they continue on their educational path. Now, I would offer two more resources. Uh, one I'm putting into the chat. We've added the resources we're discussing in the chat. Holland IQ has been tra tracking the micro-credential and alternate credential market. So I pay a lot of attention to what they're doing because it's a multi-billion dollar market worldwide. Um, so the other, the other group that's not been mentioned is Credential Engine. So a group that is trying to track the number of credentials in the United States, which last year they, they uh, produced a report counting U.S. post-secondary and secondary credentials. It was from February 2021, say close to a million uh, credentials, uh, uh, individual unique credentials in uh, the United States. So uh, just want to, uh, want to point those things out. Um, feel free to keep adding your questions in. Great job, panel. We, we just stopped and paused and took that really good question. I um, am going to move us to our next question, which is, how are you ensuring a quality learning experience in your micro-credentials, alternate credentials? And Erica, I think you're going to start us off. I am going to kick it off and say uh, our first strategy in ensuring a quality experience was to steal from others. Um, we actually started our micro-credential offering by, um, by becoming a provider using the Education Design Lab 21st Digital uh, Skills Badges framework that they had created. So that was where we started. We knew they had put a lot of research and time into the development of those. Um, and so, uh, so we are shameless about um, stealing the best work that others have produced. And then I would say the second strategy that we have used is actually taking our faculty and instructors that are issuing micro-credentials through a training that we've developed. So um, they actually get their own little badge um, that they've been micro-credential or badged uh, in terms of uh, that they earn that themselves uh, so that as instructors, they're not only able to embed uh, micro-credentials into their courses, um, and we've taught them how to do that, but they're also able to um, articulate to students what the value is of these credentials and how they might use them to also communicate their skills to employers. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, the, for us, it's been training and applying the guiding principles. They must represent marketable skills. They must be competency-based. There must be some type of faculty or staff that's uh, reviewed or assessed the information. And we've even talked to some of our very large employers about how they even view assessment criteria, right? So we've, we've had some pretty interesting, um, pretty interesting conversations that way. Um, so, uh, Leslie, what about what about your take on this idea of ensuring quality in the in the micro credential? And for you, you know, a lot of digital badging work. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Uh, quality again goes back to what is the value really. Uh, so making sure that you have defined the parameters of what it is you're issuing, and making sure that you're sticking to that. Once you kind of let people develop their own thing without following those parameters that you've set, you start to devalue what you've already created. So making sure you have that somewhat standardization, but at least maintaining a level that you're going to stick with. The other thing is inviting people to the table who are already doing like activities. So we have all of our digital badge requests or micro credential requests funnel through one area, and then we can pull together other people doing similar types of activities so we can bring them all to the table to discuss the badge it doesn't make sense or the credential it doesn't make sense to have a vital signs digital badge for nursing and a vital signs digital badge for medical assistant because vital signs are the same thing and their core competency so if you can if you can invite all the people to the table and they can have that conversation it helps both break down silos but also add that level of um, rigor and what you're looking for to verify that. 
There's a question in the chat, is there data available on student employment rates with and versus uh, without micro-credentials? Anna, thanks for that question. I'm posting um, a, a report from July uh, from Strata Education Network and Gallup that looks at the value. So they surveyed 14,000 adults. They asked them if they had a degree, not a degree. They found that one in five, uh, the micro-credential or the non-degree credential was their highest highest form of learning. And so there are some really good indicators in that report, especially for community colleges. Um, the value worth the time uh, was rated very high uh, by uh, worker learners that had earned a non-degree credential from a community college. So, and you'll also see in that report, and, and this is goes to the earlier question, I'm curious what the panel thinks about this. No one group has really dominated the delivery of micro and alternate credentials in the United States. It's very dispersed. Um, you know, it's like a fifth, a fifth, a fifth. There's like, you know, five fifths. Um, and we've got a piece of that, meaning higher education, but there are a lot of players in micro and alternate credentials. I wondered, uh, have y'all have y'all experienced that? Are you partnering with others? Just, you know, yeah. thoughts sparked my mind there. Luke, I wanted to add to that because um, also working with a design lab, I, I think it's important as you're rolling out micro-credentials or badges is really um, surveying and kind of examining the landscape in your, your region um, because we know that, you know, students are mobile and, and even if you have university transfer partners and you just want to plan for that in the design. And so we've done um, significant work in, in trying to make sure that, uh, again, these um, uh, credentials are portable and recognized by receiving other institutions in case a student may move from you know one part of our region to another um, that they're able to have that recognized because we want to make sure that and, and we'll get into prior learning assessment later um, but i did want to just add to the quality of the the credentials we used our guided pathways design principles as well as our curriculum redesign um, we went through both of those efforts in the last um, three to four years and so we want to be consistent in our approach and so those are the ways that we try to ensure um, the quality during the design development and then also the assessment of those. And we're continuing to load the chat with, um, with resources. Rachel, I hope you're grabbing those. We can, we can send it out at the end as a kind of a, a reference sheet. I'm gonna shift this to our next question. I, I did see another uh, question come in. We'll, we'll certainly get back to, uh, to that. But what is the role of prior learning assessment in your micro-credentialing strategy, Rose? So we um, underwent or um, dedicated significant resources in building up our prior learning assessment infrastructure. Um, it occurred to us about five to six years ago that we were not able to recognize, bring in um, prior learning assessment effectively and successfully and timely. Uh, so when we're talking about prior learning assessment, we're talking about anywhere from um, military credit to standardized exams, as well as industry recognized credentials and certifications. And so we, um, as part of some existing initiatives, our on-ramps project and working with our dual enrollment and our high schools, we built the infrastructure to be able to recognize industry recognized credentials to onboard students and learners onto a micro-credential, a certificate, or a degree. Um, so my best advice is as you're going through this process and you're, you're, you're discussing and trying to deliver on micro-credentials, is you need to have a robust prior learning assessment infrastructure because you're, it's in areas of occupational. So when we're talking about micro-credentials, we're seeing it more in the skills, the competencies, and more of the occupational areas that really are um, complemented by prior learning assessment. And so now that we have our PLA infrastructure in place, then we could easily and seamlessly onboard new learners onto these micro-credentials using our PLA business processes. And Leslie, do you have any other comments on prior learning assessment? So we do ours a little bit differently. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, there is a or it's a required, it's a PLA process that is statewide, where a student coming in, as Rose explained, from wherever they might be coming from, 
would need to pay a fee and take a test, do a project, do a portfolio. Um, there's different avenues. I think there's four of them, so I'm probably forgetting one of them. But it's something is required plus a, a small fee, uh, small in the relative of the beholder, I guess you could say. What we have done with our digital credentials and what we call articulation badges is we have worked with, and this might address a little bit Bianca's question about external partnerships facilitated with micro-credentials, uh, we've worked with local organizations to, they've come to us, uh, Goodwill being one of them, Forward Service Corporation, where they're trying to upskill. They're skilling their workers or they have people coming to them that they're trying to upskill. Um, might be high school age, it might be all ages that, that are going through these agencies, taking courses or training at these agencies. The agencies or the organization has come to us and we've reviewed their curriculum with our credit bearing curriculum. We've made that articulation and said your curriculum, whatever that might be, equals our curriculum. And we've signed an agreement about that. When that student, when that individual completes the curriculum to the level that we expect, we issue them a, a digital credential. If that student enrolls at Madison College, that digital credential turns into however many credits are associated with that course for that digital credential. So it provides that earner up front with something. They get that credential as they're trying to upskill, as they're trying to reskill, whatever their goals are, they have a credential. If they decide to come to college, we hope that they come to us and they can then turn those credential or those credentials into actual credits. No assessment, no fees needed because we did the articulation up front. We already know that they've done what we need them to do. Yeah, I think that's important, right? I, I, I'll speak for all the panelists and you can correct me, but I think we all have a strong focus on trying to connect micro-credentials, alter-credentials -credent to some type of credit. You know, everything that I've read, and, and Eric and I have worked a lot with Education Design Lab, talks about, you know, connecting um, these credentials to credit. Um, so that's a great point, Leslie. Rose, I saw you came off of a mute. Did you want to add a, a point? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, so with our our prior learning assessment, I, I think it's important to um, encourage um, people who are pursuing um, implementing this is also examine your academic policies um, because you want to make sure that you have that um, flexibility or that ability to be able to onboard students wherever they're coming from. I think we're all um, aware that there's a parallel higher education system out there. Um, we have a lot of alt ed providers like Coursera, um, Straighterline, uh, Study.com. And so we want to be able to meet students where they're at in our educational journey. And so that's the reason why I think prior learning assessment is important. Um, another, um, I think, what we're facing right now is um, having students return to us after starting a traditional pathway. And they found that maybe that wasn't their passion. And so they may have not done well in their first semester, right? So looking at even policies like academic renewal or second chance, um, for those students who basically say, I, I don't want to go on for a bachelor's degree, I just want to pursue a micro-credential. So it's really just examining your policies to see whether or not you can, again, meet students where they're at in their educational pathway and to be able to do that seamlessly so that you know there's no time lapse, there's no delay, and really it's just onboarding them the best you can onto these credentials. Yeah, I, I would agree. We in the district I work in have done a lot looking at our bad debt policies and actually taking action on them. Um, so I know, I know that's just one of, of many that you're referencing. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat, Erica, if you're all right, I want to, I want to have you go to the one of, uh, or either one, but I think uh, Tracy asked us, have you surveyed or researched your learners to understand what they think about micro-credentials and badges and how they perceive the value of them? So do you want to you want to take that one? Yeah, I want to take it. And actually, I can connect it um, a little bit to what Rose was saying, too, um, because um, I will say that when we did actually do a survey when we were first implementing micro-credentials and the response from our students was a little underwhelming. Right? They weren't really doing anything with them. And quite frankly, a lot of them didn't know what to do with them. Um, but we, were, we, we are still, um, at least in our college setting, in the early stages of offering credentials. 
So our students aren't familiar with the language. They're not familiar with how they use them. Some of our employer partners might not be. But here's what I would say. If we want to understand the value of micro-credentials and badges in the larger market, all we have to do is look at the explosion of LinkedIn Learning, of 2U, of edX, of Coursera, because that is, those are the folks that are providing those opportunities. And what Rose was saying, um, and we're doing the same thing, is we're starting to think about, okay, for people that enter through um, their learning, through these pathways, even if we're not offering the micro-credentials, because quite frankly, there's a lot of people out there that are doing it better than we might be doing it. We need to figure out how we use that to create that lifelong learning journey, right? That that places value and recognizes that learning as legitimate and crosswalk it to, um, to when applicable uh, credit learning experiences. So so there, and, and again, I would, I would reference the, uh, Tracy, the report that uh, Luke put up that came out of Strata Education that also has um, some data about the value um, that learners perceive around our credentials. And, and I would say, Tracy, in answer to your question, inside of our, our badge products, right, our learning experiences, um, we've got a survey at the end of all of those. And so we've mixed those in so many different ways. We've got one that learners are a part of a large health professions occupations grant, and they love the career management badge. They're like, I feel more competitive, right, because of it. We did a free test of micro-credentials this summer. We got 300 applications in two weeks because we said, look, we'll let you participate for free. And the survey results for that were, we wanted to know, why did you do it? Cost was actually the second because it was free. I need new skills for a better job. That was, that was by far and away what they were telling us. So I think the point is, survey at all points that you can, but make sure you actually look at the data, right? Because there's some things that may surprise you in it or affirm, you know, messages that you need to, you need to share. I'm watching our time and I want to get to Bianca's question. And then we've got a few more we want to finish up with. We're, we're doing okay on time. So really quickly, and this is for any of our panelists, how are external partnerships facilitated? Do the individual departments do it? Is there a central office? So how are you managing partnerships? And Leslie, you want to jump on that one? I know you're, you have lots of partnerships. We, we have lots of partnerships. Um, in, in our world at Madison College, they are all across the campus. I imagine probably every one of you somewhere in your college, there are partnerships that have been ongoing for years and new ones being created all the time. So those articulation badges that I spoke of, I just met with our admissions department, who is the, the people who facilitate when that credit transfer happens. And they are looking to actually change all of our partnerships. They want them to be a digital credential. It's so much easier. It takes away a lot of that verification personal time where they have to search, is this person this person? Did they actually do this? Where did it come from? They wanna change it all to be digital. Uh, we also have a business and industry department that does training with business and industry. That is their sole focused contract training. So they are doing, I wouldn't say necessarily partnerships, it's more contracts. Um, we have community-based organizations that have the articulation agreement. There is, these partnerships are all over the place. What I, what we do, what does happen with these is that all of the digital credentials go through one department. So the partnerships, it's best to make partnerships with the people who have the connections. You've got that, you, you already know them. You've got that person, that group of people. So create that partnership, extend that branch, whatever that, that has to be. The credentials, I think is smart, especially when you're starting to come through one centralized location. That way you can maintain that control, maintain that value. As you grow, you might find better ways where you can kind of outsource around the college but especially when you're starting, bring those credentials into one spot, but start to create those business processes. That articulation process that we have, we have a business process that crosses many, many departments at our college because it has to go through admissions. It has to hit our registrar. It has to come through credentials. Create the process and then start to fit people into the process. Don't fit people outside and then make a process for every little way you do things. Yeah, because at a point you can't scale that 
Um, so I'm going to go to the next question, just paying attention to our time. We've got 20 minutes. We're, we're doing really great. Um, Erica, what are you learning from working with business and industry? You're doing a lot of direct work. I am too with business and industry. So is, so is Leslie and Rose. But what are, what are you learning? Is there you know, a top thing that just really sticks in your mind that you want to share with the group that's with us? Yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm going to um, offer two things. And one is that, um, is that if you're working directly with uh, business and industry uh, in, in terms of identifying the high value of what um, they want to see in micro-credentials, um, we need to be uh, letting them um, define the language uh, because um, sometimes, as Rose alluded to at the beginning of this, the academic language that, that we use is not the language that internally they might be using or even looking for um, as they're looking for certain skills in candidates. So, um, so that's one important lesson. And then I'd say the second um, thing is that there is a lot of um, opportunity in this space to work with business and industry because of the talent shortages, because of the high need to upskill and reskill their employees. And I think they are really open to partnering with colleges because they trust um, the, the, the validity uh, that came up. One of you said, what, is it, what, is, what distinguishes you know, colleges and other brick and mortar institutions? Um, because we're accredited, because we as community colleges and other institutions have longstanding uh, relationships with the industries in our communities. And they are looking for those, that leadership and that partnership um, from your college to create those value add credentials that they can use to advance um, and um, mobilize their employees. And I would say one of the, just this is a high level observation, I'm curious what y'all think that I've had is that coming out of the recession right in 2010, I notice a disinvestment in your own employees and I'm sensing something completely different. What I'm hearing is more investment, more programs, more opportunities. That's what our partners are saying, right? They're, we got past COVID. We're actually not all the way out, right? We still are having staffing challenges, but we're putting it in our budget next year. I had, I had a partner tell us that last week. It's in our budget. We're going back in on our, our, on our staff, right? And on our, our employees. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, one, one last question um, to, the, to the group, and then we've got a couple in the chat that I think are going to take us on home. So what is your prediction for the future of alternate credentials? I, I wanted us to get to this question. So um, Rose and Leslie, you, at the institution level, um, what's your prediction for alternate credentials? And don't worry, folks, we're going to get to your questions in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, I wish I had that crystal ball to kind of predict where it's going to go. But I, I do feel like it is going to probably um, really shape, shift our conversations of how we design learning and learning experiences. Um, you know, people are looking to dip in and out of higher education to get what they need to get where they're, you know, higher paying job or re-careering. And so we need to be more agile. We need to be faster. We need to be more responsive. And I think, you know, all of you probably had those conversations in terms of, you know, sometimes edu higher education moves at like a snail's pace, but we need to be, you know, it's the Coursera's and all these Alted providers that are showing us the direction and the future of learning, right? That learning can take place anywhere at any time from anyone. And so we need to kind of borrow from some of those best practices to be able to um, deliver on, you know, that high quality, top stellar educational experiences for our learners in our region. So what I would say is that we're probably going in a direction of more uh, mastery proficiency, competency-based learning experiences that are, are short term um, so that we can get individuals out into the workforce and getting into, you know, high paying careers and jobs. Leslie? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think this, this smaller chunked up education, modularized educa education, whatever you want to call it, is meeting people where they're at. 
Uh, we have to deliver the education and the training needed when they need it. And it's changing so fast. Our technology is changing so fast. The things they need to know are changing so fast that the, the long degrees, although they're fantastic and I'm not knocking them at all, providing shorter steps to get to them is going to be a much more long-term solution. Um, I completely agree with what Luke was saying about recognizing your employees. We found in this year, 2021, that we are building badges at our campus for our internal training. So for our faculty staff admin at a two to one rate to our student training. So we have a lot of, of student skill development badges, of course, but that side of things, the internal training, recognizing our employees and what they're doing is literally growing at a two to one rate right now. Because although we might not be able to offer monetary compensation all the time, we're providing them something and they're being recognized for the work that they're doing on their own time a lot of times. So that in and of itself is huge. And Erica, what about in the United States? So Rose and Leslie took us through, you know, the institutional perspective. What's your prediction of alternate credentials in the United States? Well, I'll tell you as a practitioner of futures thinking that I don't make predictions. I talk about possible futures. So, um, I just referenced the fact that last week, um, you know, I, I attended that National Governors Association and, um, and the focus of that was state strategies for skills and lifelong learning systems. And, um, and so my, uh, I think that we are seeing uh, already knocking at our door as a possible future where degrees will not be the strongest hiring signal qualifier uh, in the future, that credentials um, that are based on skills will be. And that does not mean, just like Leslie said, that people won't still be earning degrees. But I believe that even with someone's certificate, a degree certificate, the metadata is going to show the alignment of those to the skills and competencies. Um, and not only that, um, because we now have the digital capability, it will also show the actual work that that student or learner has done to demonstrate their skills and competencies in that area. Yeah, and uh, I have the question from the global perspective. I I'll tell you how I feel. I feel like I'm in the 90s again, where online learning was the rage, right? There was this whole website uh, called No Significant Difference. And, and right, so trying to prove that it was, I feel like we're there again, right? It, it felt like the Wild West. It was the Wild West. People were trying to put their hands around it. They were trying to define quality standards, you know, and as, long, and as far as we've come, right? And Leslie, I know you've seen a decade of this. I just feel like that. I'm like, oh, wow, could it be that in my lifetime, I'll see another movement like online learning that has the impact on learning and working. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I feel like that. I'm just like, wow, is this really going to happen in my life? And I don't think it's going away. And globally, it excites me, right? Because it means, well, maybe I should think global. Maybe there's Areas where my expertise applies not here, right? Or I'm going to go learn something different. I thought the panelists this morning from Open UK was excellent, right? And how they think about, you know, apprenticeships. You started talking about apprenticeships. So anyway, I get excited thinking about um, about the predictions or uh, I'm sorry, what was it you said? Possible futures. So uh, we're going to choose to edit our own question. Um, so we've got two, two uh, questions in the chat. We're about 10 minutes from stop time. Uh, we want to keep, uh, keep rolling with uh, responding to our audience. So here's, here's one, folks. What do you think will differentiate micro-credentials at community colleges and other brick-and-mortar institutions from virtual sites like Coursera and Google certificates? I've got some thoughts, but I'm really curious what my panelists think. So anybody want to take a shot at that one? I want to I want to add I I did reference that um, earlier, but you know one of the things that I think um, that we still um, we still do that we need to consider how do we do in relation to these micro learning opportunities is the wraparound support and quite frankly the live real time whether that's virtual in person getting your hands on machinery and equipment and technology, 
Um, it's what we can offer on our site um, and campuses and in our virtual spaces that provides um, structured support as individuals go through that learning experience. Yeah, I, I would like to add to that, Erica. I think it goes back to something that you were reiterating and that's the vil uh, validity um, industry and, and workplace partners do look to higher education to provide that verification and that validation um, in terms of the quality of the credential. Um, and then we also provide intentionality and cohesion. So a student could go in there and take all the self-interest lifelong learning, learning courses um, that they want, but we can really help guide them in terms of you know, making better selections in terms of what their career and maybe perhaps transfer goals are. So really helping them make those um, decisions that are critical in their pathway. And I would just say this, I think the aggregator is going to win. And, and with respect to the Excelsior Colleges of the world, and I respect, but I think the aggregator is going to win. The person that figures out how to weave this information together, right, weave these learning experiences, put the wraparound support, put the, put the learning experience that the person wants just in time, that will be the winner. Um, and, and I don't know what that looks like, right? I haven't figured that out for my own institution and the, the colleges I serve, but I'm convinced from a strategic standpoint that the aggregators win. And, and you cannot do it all. There's just too much good content, right? Um, so that's one. Um, that's, that's one thought. I want to go to this next question, just looking at the time. But Leslie, did you have a point you wanted to make? I saw you lean up. I just want to make sure. Was there a point you wanted to make on this question before we move? That's okay. Move on to the next one. Okay. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. So maybe we'll go to you on this one. Is What's the best way to earn award-winning credibility to internally, de uh, to internally developed at your college's pool of micro-credentials in a short time in specialized fields? Okay, the best way to earn award-winning credibility. Well, I imagine that you, because you already have these specialized fields, you probably already have some of this award-winning credibility at your college. The value that you are bringing with your credentials is you. You already hold this value. A lot of people think when they're creating credentials, they have to create something new. It's not necessarily about creating something new. It's about looking at what are you already doing really well? that the rest of the world doesn't know about. So what can you add a digital representation of, that digital badge? The badge is a representation of something, right? You're already doing things really great at your college. You might just not know about it or other people don't know about it. So that would be, I think, the, the quickest way to get these uh, award-winning credibility for your badges is to use what you're already doing really well. Put something digital around it, now it can go viral. It can be shared among people. When we brought these to our continuing ed space, our classes were filling because of when people shared their badges online. We are consumers of digital content. Kids today love to share every single thing that they do. If you can put these in their hands to share online, they will do it. So look at what you're doing, look at what you're doing well and start exploiting it. I think that's a great point. Anybody else want to have a, a response to that? I, I do. Um, that's exactly what we did. We, we, we used what we were already doing and we are tweaking it and we're refining it. And obviously there's going to be points of evolution as part of the process, but we just got to do it. Just get going on it, right? Because we've been making these promises to our learners for a long time. They have these expectations. They want to see it from us. And so it's just really, let's get to work and dive into it and deliver on it. I would also, for any of you that are in markets where you have a big employer, that's the other place I would start. Um, we're fortunate right now to be in a conversation with a, 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 an employer partner who's a global employer. And we're, um, we're working, we're pairing a curriculum designer to work with them. Um, and we're starting this curriculum on our non-credit side because we have a lot more agility in our non-credit workforce training unit. We have um, you know, less uh, hoops that we have to go through in terms of approval process. And it doesn't mean we're not also going to be 
partnering and working with our academic side because we absolutely want this training to matriculate into credit options, but we know that we can move the process faster in non-credit. And especially when we have a huge global partner that is saying, if you offer this, we'll market it. We're all in. <laughs> Sometimes I like to ask leaders, you know, what are they listening to? What are they paying attention to? And if any of you are just needing this entrepreneurial frame, right? As much as I like to think I'm an entrepreneur, I've been consuming a lot of uh, a lot of masters of scale. So I, I don't know if uh, if anyone uh, is familiar with uh, Reed Hoffman and masters of scale, but I've I've been consuming a lot of that um, a lot of that podcast. It's helped me. One day I was driving to work, had a decision to make on a strategy, and the episode was the simple plan wins. And I was like, oh, wow, that's it. It really is that simple. Um, so I put that in the chat. The other thing that I would add is uh, you may want to pay attention to this group. Our, our friend, I know she's a friend of WCET, a uh, longtime Lumina colleague, Holly Zanville, is leading an effort called Credential As You Go. Uh, and I'm really interested to see where this goes. One, because Holly's been tracking this all of her career. I'm completely enamored with her and anything that she she does in terms of these topics. And so um, this is another another uh, uh, group uh, or organization to pay attention to. We're about four minutes left. I know, uh, Rachel, we want to put up our uh, contact information. So we want to invite you to connect with us, please. Um, I, I will tell you for me, I, I won't speak for anyone else. LinkedIn is the best, uh, is the, is the best way to get in touch uh, with me. Uh, but there's our contact information there. Um, and Erica, I promised you that you would get the, the last word as our future of work strategist. So do you have any, any final thoughts that you want to share, or Rose or Leslie for that matter, before we? Um, I think I would just remind us of the, of the famous quote. And of course, right now I'm blanking on it. So maybe someone in the audience can help me who to attribute this to. But the quote is, the future is already here. It is just not evenly distributed. So I would say that um, be watching for the signals um, uh, that, that help us understand uh, the future that is already here. Right. And I'll add to that in terms of, I think it's very common, everybody is aware of it, the definition of insanity. If we keep doing the same thing and expecting different results, uh, we're going to drive ourselves crazy. And so really begin, you know, figuring out solutions for learners and how we can change the way we do business to meet them, you know, uh, today's learner. And I, I'll just uh, end with this is, uh, if you will, please fill out the survey. We want to know how we did. We want to know if you felt like you got what you needed. Um, so that's one. Um, two, I want to personally thank Erica and Rose and Leslie for responding to a stranger that reached out to you and said, hey, I like what I think you're doing. Would you want to present? I, I really appreciate you uh, just returning the email or call or however I reached out to you. All right, Rachel, I think with that. Thank you. Bravo, Luke, Erica, Rose, Leslie, thank you so much. It was a wonderful panel. I think everyone here is buzzing with energy and ready to, to create some credentials. So thank you to all of you. Uh, again, please fill out the survey. We appreciate your feedback. Um, and following this, uh, you are welcome to join us uh, back into uh, a fun networking social closeout to the day. So hop back in the lobby, look around for some sessions and, and come back in. So thank you all. Uh, we appreciate your energy time. Take care, everyone. Thank you.